Hello everyone and welcome to the last five chapters of Chains by Lori House Anderson. This is by popular demand. I'm sorry it took so long. It's been uh, kind of a busy couple of years teaching, uh, but here I am finally doing it. You're going to notice that this looks a little different than my last videos because my son usually helps me with the video part of it and uh, he's traveling. So I'm going to try it this way. Let me know how you think, what you think about it. So I'd also like to thank everyone for all the great comments that you leave for me. I do try to read them all and for subscribing to my channel. I'm going to be uh, making, uh, reading more books this summer uh, while I'm off and hopefully some of them you'll really enjoy. Um, you'll notice too that I've also stopped really doing a lot of the summaries at the end of the chapters. I'll try and do that again a little bit, but I really want you to think about uh, things like characters and setting and tone when you're listening to the stories. Lori House Anderson has some amazing metaphors and similes and imagery in her stories that are by far amazing that you can actually write about in your essays that you might have to do for English class or your analysis that you'll have to do. Um, if you need any help, send me a message and I can always try and help you out as well. So. Anyway, hope you enjoy the last five chapters. Thanks again for listening, and thanks for always being there uh, with the great comments. Have a great summer. Chapter 41, Tuesday, January 7th to Wednesday, January 15th, 1777. When Madame woke the next morn, her first command was for hot scones. Her second was that the seamstress must be fetched immediately. The British commandant was throwing a ball in honour of Queen Charlotte's birthday in ten days' time. Madame required a new gown for such an occasion, perhaps two. I learned of all this when I returned from the market with a fresh-killed chicken. Hannah, who had taken over the boss lady job from Sarah after the baby was born, was preparing a cherry pie. Mary sat by the window mending one of Madame's skirts. The notion of a ball for a queen confuddled me. That's a long voyage for a celebration, I said. Hannah laughed. No, you ninny, the queen isn't coming. How could she? She's got ten children to ca take care of, plus all them castles. Eleven, added Mary. She popped out a new one last spring. Even though the queen can't come, the officers always hold a ball in her honor. Hannah said as she rolled out the pie dough. Give them good, gives them a good excuse to eat too much, drink too much, and make proper fools of themselves whilst dancing. I pulled out the feather bag and a basin. And Madame Lockton is attending? The colonel will be her escort. Mary bit her thread in two. All the rich folk will be there. I tipped a handful of feathers from the chicken and stuffed them in a bag. Does Madame require anything of us? Not yet, Hannah said, carefully laying the dough in the pie plate. That will change, no doubt. I have seen the queen herself, you know, Mary said, squinting at her stitches. With your own eyes, I asked Hannah. Asked Hannah. I don't believe you. Well, I seen her carriage and she was in it. The backside of the carriage, mind. Actually, the backside of the troops guarding the backside of the carriage. But I saw the wheels bent down to it. She threaded another needle. Another needle. Bet you don't know her name. Her Majesty, said Hannah. Proves you're not a Londoner, Mary said. Her proper name is Her Majesty Queen Charlotte of Great Britain, Duchess Sophia Charlotte of Mecklenburg's Strelitz. How do you remember all these names when you can't remember from one minute to the next how much salt goes into the biscuits? asked Hannah. Biscuits are not as important as the queen. I practiced her name from the time I was a girl, in case the day ever came when she saw me on the street and I could call out her entire gracious name. If I did that, her carriage would stop and she'd make me a lady in waiting on account of my good manners. There was a moment of silence while the two women considered this then a loud outburst as they fell over themselves laughter, in laughter. After dinner, Lady Seymour had a frightful seizure of the apoplexy. Looked just like one of Ruth's fits, except not with so much shaking. She fell into a sleep so deep I thought she was stone dead, but every so often she'd take a breath, and once she opened her eyes. When she woke the next morning, she could not speak nor move her legs. Dr. Dasson arrived and bled her and stuck pins in her limbs and gave her a bitter tea. In truth, there was nothing could, that could make her better. I was told to tend to her again, as I had right after the fire. I fed her and held her teacup to her lips and wiped her chin when, the dribbled, when she dribbled and helped her with her chamber pot business. This was most distressing for her, and she cried. Then I wiped the tears from her face. I heard Madame ask the doctor plain when the old lady would die. The doctor would not answer her. I figured Madame wanted Lady Seymour to die as soon as possible, but not before the Queen's Ball. If the house was in mourning, it wouldn't be proper for Madame to dance with the Admiral and make merry. 
A week before the ball, Madame ordered that Lady Seymour be moved to the parlor bedchamber downstairs so she could reclaim the largest bedchamber for herself. After two privates had carried the lady down and she was popped, propped up on pillows so she could look out the window, Madame called me upstairs. I want this room aired and the linens boiled, girl. It smells of decay in here. The work of the day was simple and heavy. Strip the bed, haul down the linens for the wash, clean out the hearth, open the windows and wash them inside and out. Take the rugs down and beat them in the yard, sweep and mop the floor, take the rugs back in, close the windows and give all the wood a polish. When the chamber was clean, Madame told me to open the windows again and let them stand open all afternoon to make sure there was no lingering pestilence in the air. I did as I was told. The doctor came right before supper and gave Lady Seymour a potion that would make the night pass quicker for her. When she was ready for bed, Madame called for me to bring up warming pan filled with coals and run it between the sheets because they were chilled and still a wee bit damp. I did what she asked, then returned to the kitchen, dumped the coals in the hearth, and crept under my own blanket. She called for me again. The sheets were still too cold for her liking. I refilled the warming pan, carried it up the stairs, and warmed her bed. Then I stroked the fire in her hearth before returning down the stairs. The third time she called for me, I was sore tempted to dump the glowing coals onto her bed, let it blaze, and ask if it was warm enough, but I did not. I performed the task she gave me, and when she called a quarter an hour later, I did it again. The sun rose bright the next day, catching in the icicles that hung from the, the eaves and jumping off the snow like a mirror. The linens pegged out on the line were frozen, stiff, as wood and covered, wood and covered in lacework of ice. The clouds scuttled away and the sun blazed, turning the yard into a garden of jewels. Ah, oh, Ruth would have loved this. If we were free and at home in Rhode Island and these were our sheets and our laundry lines and our snow, she would dance like an angel. The pictures in my brain pan caught me by surprise. I could not clear them away. She'd clapped her hands and the sight of the frozen laundry. She'd twirl in the spinning swirls of snow that lifted in the breeze. She'd plunge her hands into the bushes to pluck off the diamonds. She would do all of these things and laugh and... The wind tossed a handful of snow on my face and washed it all away. Ruth would not see this, never. I dried my face. Why was I thinking of Ruth? I'd worked so hard to pack, away, pack her away from my mind, along with the thoughts of Mama and Papa and the life Ruth and I were promised. It didn't help to ponder these things that were forever gone. It only made a body restless and fill, with, fill up with the bees, all wanting to sting something. I kicked at the new snow. It rose up a sparkling diamond breeze fit for a queen. It was Lady Seymour who did it, her with her begging forgiveness for not buying me and telling me that I'd been good slave to her. her, her with her wet eyes and skeleton hands. Did she ever think about setting me free? That would be a fine question to ask. Of course, there was no sense to asking because her mouth didn't work anymore. I carried the big laundry basket out to the sheets. I'd have to hang them, hang them in the kitchen else they wouldn't dry till spring. Another picture hung itself in my mind, the poetry book in the stationery shop, the one I'd been afraid to read. Miss Phyllis Wheatley went free when her master released her. It was on account of her fame, Mama said. Master Wheatley looked the fool for keeping a poetical genius enslaved in a household. I'd heard of other slaves who'd bought their freedom, folks who were given their Sunday afternoons to work for themselves, who saved their pennies and farthings for years and years until they had piled up the hundreds and fifty, the hundred and fifty or two hundred pounds to buy their body and soul from their master. If I had Sunday afternoons free, I'd figure a way to earn my pennies. I would sew or hire out to scrub tables. I'd even clean the cells at Bridewell where the guards asked. I took a long, I took a long stick from the pile of kindling wood. It would never happen. Madame would never allow it. She was set on keeping my arms and legs dancing to her tune and my soul bound to her chains. I pulled the stick back and cracked it against the side of the frozen bend linen. The ice shattered and fell to the ground, tinkling like pieces of fallen stars. That's the end of this chapter. So as you can see, um, Ruth, sorry, Ruth is still in, on uh, Isabel's mind. Isabel's still working so hard for Miss Lockton. It's, it's really a tough life for her, but she still dreams of freedom because that's what she really, really wants. Next chapter. Chapter 42, Thursday, January 16th to Saturday, January 18th, 1777. 
Dr. Dasson visited Lady Seymour each morning and eve. She could nod her head yes and shake it no to his questions. Yes, she knew who she was. No, she had no sensation in her feet nor her hands. She could barely chew milk-soaked bread and sip broth. Her mind had not gone soft, though. Her eyes blazed bright in her skull and followed me as I moved around the room, and when the doctor and madam talked, she listened right close. Plainly said, she was as much a prisoner in her broken body as Curzon was in his cell. Madame Seamstress came near as frequent as the doctor. The birthday ball gown had a scarlet red underskirt topped with a short gown of royal navy blue, embroidered with gold. The hairdresser and Madame spent hours consulting prints of fashionable ladies in Paris so that they could design a suitable hairstyle. I was not privy to the details, but I heard Madame talking about jewels made of paste that would sit in her curls. She was also wanted a small British flag to fly atop her locks, but the hairdresser talked her out of that one. Hannah and Mary talked about the ball every waking minute. I am sure even the Queen herself would have grown tired of hearing about it. At noon, the guns at the battery, which the British had taken to calling Fort George, would fire a royal salute. And an hour later, the warships in the harbour would blast a response. At six o'clock, the guests would arrive at the ball, with trumpets playing and drums beating a welcome. The dancing would last until midnight, when the fireworks would explode over the harbour. And after that, the banquet would begin. There was no way under heaven that Madame was going to survive six hours of dancing without having something to eat. I finished reading Common Sense that night before the ball. The bookseller was right. The words were dangerous. Every one of them. I ought to throw it in the fire, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. Mr. Payne knew how to stir up the pot. He went right after the king and attacked the crown on his head. I laid down one long road of a sentence in my rememory. For all men being originally equals, no one by birth could have a right to set up his own family in perpetual preference to all others forever. Huh. The way I saw it, Mr. Payne was saying that all people were the same and that no one deserved a crown or was born to be higher than another. And that's why America was going to make their own freedom. It was a wonder the book did not explode into flames in my hands. I buried it back in my hidey hole and laid myself down to sleep. My eyes would not close. My thoughts were churned up like muddy water, with dangerous eels thrashing through it. If an entire nation could seek its freedom, why not a girl? And if a girl was to seek her freedom, how could she do such a fool-headed thing? especially a girl trapped in New York. Best thing would be to break into the desk of a British commander, steal a pass, and forge her name and his name on it, and act free. And pigs were likely to fly, too. Plus, that girl seeking freedom would have to walk. She could walk the mile from Wall Street to the north edge of the city, but then she'd run into the guards stationed there. She'd have to sneak past them and not get shot. Then she'd have 11 miles of running to the north edge of the island. If she took the Greenwich Road or the Post Road, she'd likely be captured by one in need of a slave or in need of the reward paid for a healthy runaway. If she struck to the woods that ran up the center of the island, she could be eaten by a bear or drowned in a swamp. If angels guided her safely to the woods and she made to the north edge, she'd have to get past the guards watching over King's Bridge, where New York Island touched the rest of America. I rolled over, my back to the fire. That girl could be more likely grab hold of the feet of a passing crow and bid him fly her to safety. Better yet, spread her own wings. The only path was across the water. A girl like that could not swim and did not own a boat. Not to mention the river currents were fast and the crossing could be noted by someone who could raise a ruckus and then the soldiers would line up a firing squad and shoot that girl dead in the water. They wouldn't even bury her proper. They would just let the water take the boat and the body, and both would be consumed by sea monsters. I fell asleep cursing them that planted the city of New York on an island. My dawn visits up the commons had become the most ordinary of errands. Madame never woke early enough to note my absence, and the soldier wives were so grateful to avoid the chore they never told. Curzon had grown terribly thin and was still feverish, but his leg had healed up, and he greeted me at the window every day. After I left the prison, I'd fetch the water and head back to Wall Street, passing by the Golden Hill Tavern in case Captain Morse needed me, which he never, ever did. 
So when the captain signaled me from the tavern porch the next morning, I was surprised. I had not seen him for weeks, not since the news of the rebel victory at Trenton. Good day, just Sal, he said with a sleepy smile. How do you fare? Good enough, sir, I said. Is something amiss? He winced and pulled his coat tighter. Nothing grave, no news of battle or prisoner exchange. I waited while he sought the words. I'm in need of a favor, he finally said. It's of no worldly import, but it is a matter of honor for me. Sir, I must repay a debt, just Sal. I wager Captain William Farrow that the British would not dare to hold this ridiculous birthday celebration. It's a slap in the face to the people who are starving. Yes, sir. He frowned and kicked at a stone poking up from the half-frozen mud. But I'm proven wrong, aren't I? Thousands of pounds are being wasted, and so I owe my friend Captain Farrett a penny. A gentleman always pays his debts promptly, be them large or small. I was confuddled. And you want that I should... He threw up his hands in frustration. The British have confined all American officers to their lodging houses today. Why? Well, they fear we might mount an insurrection while they are dancing minu minu minuets and gorging on stuffed goose. They have a point. The ball would provide the perfect cover for a surprise attack if Washington were we're nearby. So I am prevented from making good on my bet to William, and he is prevented from coming round to collect his due. It is a small matter of honor, to be sure, but when in reduced circumstances, these things take on greater weight, don't you think? Still confuddled, I nodded my head. I nodded my head. Yes, sir. Good. Then you'll do it. Do what? Take the penny to William with my salutations. It will give him a good laugh. He lives on Chapel Street, a house with red shutters on the corner of Warren. Say you'll do it for me, just Sal, and the next penny I earn goes into your pocket, upon my word. Madam would be wig deep in preparations for the ball all day. The soldier wives would too, for they belonged to the army of servants who would work at the birthday dinner. Lady Seymour required only a warm fire and an occasional help with a teacup. A walk, in to Warren, a, a walk up to Warren Street on a sunny day such as this would be most welcome. Happy to help, Captain, I said. The roar of cannons sh shook the kitchen just after midday and made me near jump out of my skin. I dropped the turnip I was peeling and it rolled across the floor. What was that? I asked, clutching the table. Are we under attack? Hannah laughed and used the poker to push the logs back into the hearth. No, you goose, that's the royal salute for Her Majesty. Mary pressed the hot iron against the apron on the table. Do you figure they might meet us early? The major said five o'clock, Hannah said. Give us time to finish up here. Will you get to see the dancing, I asked. Nah, Mary said. They'll be too busy running us ragged setting up the dinner. But they're providing, promise to feed us good. She picked up the apron and studied it for wrinkles. I wish my mother could see this, serving at a queen's birthday ball. Too bad your mother's on the other side of the globe with her majesty, Hannah said. They'll both be tragical late to the party, Mary giggled. Madam sent a note to her friend Jane, Jane Drinkwater, who agreed to bring her collection of necklaces and the latest gossip to tea. The news caused Madam to send the soldier wives, pawing through the entire attic for a gown she had not worn yet this year. Hannah sent me to fetch more water, which I did with great pleasure and a short detour. The houses on Warren Street were a mix. Some were modest, two or three were rather grand, with arches over the windows and fancy boot scrapers by the front door. The trees and fences in the neighborhood had all been cut down for firewood. It made the corner of Warren and Chapel look underdressed. I went round the back of the house with the red shutters, knocked on the door, and explained my errand to a maid, who fetched Captain Farrer for me, a horse-faced man with an easy laugh. Good Captain Morgan is indeed a gentleman, he said as I presented him with the coin, and you're the girl who carries messages to his men in Bridewell. Yes, sir. My lads are locked up in the old sugar house, he said, smile fading. The ones, that still, the ones that are still alive. He stood there, caught up in silence and his own thoughts. I tried to think of a polite way to take my leave, but could not find the proper words. The breeze came from the south and carried a salt tang with it. Although snow lay about and everyone was trapped, was wrapped deep in their clothing. The appearance of the clouds made a body know deep down what the spring was stirring. Yes, sir, I finally said, begging pardon, but I must be on my way. Oh, of course, of course, he said, his eyes still distant. I walked down the path to Warren Street and stopped when I heard him call, Sal, uh, wait there a moment. I stood a while longer, watching the clouds and scolding myself for mixing in with the affairs of gentlemen and their honor. Several carriages containing bundled-up ladies and serious-looking officers passed along the street. 
pulled by shaggy-coated horses. Most folks took no more notice of me than they would a cat cartman selling oysters or a vagabond from Cabinstone. Just as I set my mind to leave, Captain Farrah came back out. Give this to Morse, please, he said as he handed me the note. He'll know what to do. I studied the folded paper and made bold. Another wager, sir? Another carriage passed on the street, and the horses clipping clip-clopped slowly. He shook his head, the laughter gone from his eyes. No, no news from headquarters. Don't tarry with it. He touched his fingertips to the brim of his hat. I bobbed a curtsy and took my leave, hurrying towards the tea water pump. I should have known I'd be pressed into more message carrying. These soldier types were forever scheming up with one, one another, one with one thing over another. Sorry, and it put a girl like me in a rough spot. Not that they ever thought about that. I didn't ask for ferry messages across the city for some captain I didn't know. How was that connected to my deal with Dibbin to treat Curzon proper? It wasn't, not one bit. The good captains Morse and Farrer would ha just have to wait till it suited me for this last message to be delivered. If I didn't get back soon, I'd be in for it. I pushed through the back door to the Lockton's kitchen, still fussing about the selfish captains who only thought their own skins, who only thought of their own skins. When Curzon got out, he'd have a debt of honor the size of a whale to me, and I'd make that boy. I set down the water buckets, removed my cloak, and hung it from a peg near the fire. I stood rubbing my hands together and warming them over the flames. As soon as I could move them, I boiled the water. The door from the front hall slammed open. There you are. The words came at me like shards of glass. I turned. Twas Madame Lockton holding a small riding crop in her hand. Ma'am? She crossed the room and slashed the crop across my face. It hurt fierce, but I knew not to cry out. How dare you, she spat. That's the end of this chapter. So it seems Miss Lockton is up to her old tricks again with, uh, with Sal or Isabel. Um, Isabel is uh, caught up in another um, message passing scheme that she's going to probably get her into more trouble than she needs. But again, seeking freedom, she'll do whatever she wants or whatever she can to get that freedom. Next chapter soon. Chapter 43, Saturday, January 18th, 1777. Please, ma'am, I started. Silence, she crapped the crop across my shoulder. The back door opened and Hannah entered. Oh, excuse me, she said, turning to leave again. Stay, madam ordered. Hannah let the door close and murmured. Yes, madam, her eyes stealing once to me, then quickly away. I fought the urge to run for the knife drawer. Madam paced in front of me. I have never in my entire life been so humiliated. She paused and put a mimicking face. I saw your little black girl talking to a rebel officer on Warren Street. Do you allow your slaves to concert with the enemy? I could not swallow nor breathe. She brought the crop down with a crack on the edge of the table. Jane Drinkwater said this to me. Jane Drinkwater, the biggest gossip in New York. Madam paced again, her hair flying loose, her manner quite unsteady. I said, no, Jane, you must be mistaken. Not our Sal. Colonel Hawkins himself uses her for errands. She stops suddenly, and Jane says, No, Anne, your girl was speaking to a rebel prisoner on Warren Street. It's hard to miss the mark on her face. From my carriage, I saw her take a note from his hand. I opened my mouth to protest, but she slashed at me again. This time the blow opened a cut on my forehead. Give me that note, demand, Madam demanded. I have no note, Madam, I said quiet. She held out her hand. Liar! Give me the paper or I'll turn you over to the British commander for so fast your full head will spin. Her, ver her voice shook with rage. I reached into my pocket and pulled out the folded note. Madam looked over to Hannah. See, you just need to be firm with them. Hannah said nothing. A drop of blood rolled down the side of my face. I clutched the note in my fist. Give it, Madam narrowed her eyes. Did you hear me, girl? Everybody carried a little evil in them. Mama once told me. Madame Lockton had more than her share. The poison had eaten holes through her soul and made room for vermin to nest inside her. Girl, Madame snapped her, stamped her foot on the floor. The evil inside me woke and crackled like lightning. I could wrap my hands around her throat. I could brain her with a poker, thrust her face, face into the flames. I could beat her senseless with my fists. I shook from the effort of holding myself still, clutching the crumpled paper. Mama said we have to fight the evil inside us by overcoming it with goodness. 
She said it was a hard thing to do, but it made us worthy. I breathed deep to steady myself. I threw the captain's note into the fire. Hannah gasped. Man shrieked and pushed me out the way. The paper was already lit. She dropped the crop and smacked me again in the face with her hand, as she had the day when I first landed in New York. You fool, bloody wench! She reached behind her, picked up a bowl, and hurled it at me. I ducked and it crashed against the hearth. I will sell you, she screamed. I will auction you at dawn on Monday. I'll sell your demon sister too, or the most cruel, heartless master I can find, the devil himself, if he wants. She paused to catch her breath. Ruth? Hannah stepped forward. I do not believe there's, I do believe there's a knock at the front door, madam, she said. But she had already sold Ruth. Madam glared at her. Then answer it, you bloody fool. Didn't she? As Hannah left, Madam brushed back her hair, gathering her dignity. I still stood by the fire where the note had burned to fine ash. I could not think what might happen next. Madam tugged at her short gown. What's that stupid look on your face, she said with a harsh laugh. You didn't know I still owned her, did you? Ruth? The name escaped my mouth. Brat. Madam spat. Couldn't find a buyer. Had to ship her down to Charleston. I shall tell the estate manager to get rid of her. Toss her in the swamp. Her death will be on your head, you insolent fool. Hannah came back in the hall. The hairdresser, madam. What? Madam wheeled about. What did you say? The hairdresser is come to prepare you for the ball. The queen's ball, ma'am. You must leave in a few hours. Madam cleared her throat and stood straighter. Oh, of course. You must first help me with my gown. Hannah nodded. Hannah nodded. Yes, ma'am. Lock the girl in the potato bin and then come upstairs. The bin was more than half filled with potatoes and smelled of damp earth and worms. There was not enough room to sit up, but lying down was like lying in a bed of rocks. I wanted to scream and pinch myself hard to fight the urge. I did not want to give Madame my satisfaction. Overhead came the noises of footsteps as the hairdresser performed his job and left, and the colonel returned from headquarters to change into his dress uniform, and Madame sent Hannah running for his folderol and that. There was a sound of horse hooves and the roll of carriage wheels and the front door opened and then closed and the house fell quiet, save for Hannah's steps in the kitchen. A light appeared through the boards of the bin. It's me, Hannah said. She's gone. The light was set on the ground. Then there was a fumbling of a key to the padlock. The bin door opened and Hannah peered in. I brought, I bought, brought you some things here. She handed me a chamber pot, a blanket and a mug of water. Tain't right to lock you away with nothing. You ain't an animal. Let me go, please, I pleaded. But before I could say anything further or reach for her, she had slammed down the door and shot home the lock again. I'll be back by dawn and check on you then, she said. Try to sleep. Please, Hannah, please, I beg of you. Her footsteps flew up the stairs and the door slammed. I thought I heard a sob, but perhaps I didn't. The bees overtook me then. As evening moved into night, they ate through me and hived and up inside my brain pan with a loud buzz, their wings beating me into submission. Someone whimpered and cried, and it must have been me, but it mattered not, for I was already dead. It was only a few days, perhaps hours, until my heart would stop beating, in truth, and the bees would fly off to hunt someone else. And then came the sound of a distant roar, like a lion just sprung from a trap. The bees paused, and I froze, waiting. No one was home except for Lady Seymour, and she was not capable of making noise. The roar came again. I cocked my head and listened. It did not come from the street nor the house above. It was not, it was not cannon fire. It was inside me, a thought, a thunderous loud. Ruth was alive, alive in Charleston, in South Carolina, not a ship, not an island, alive in a town I can walk to. My toes wiggled in my sturdy black shoes and my, leg, and my legs itched. I lay flat as I could, on the bumpy mound of potatoes, and kicked once at the boards in the bin. My heavy shoes made a terrible loud noise on the wood. I stopped, counted to 100. There came no sound from overhead, no commotion out on the street. I kicked again at the same spot. The potatoes under me shifted and the mug of water overturned. I kicked a third time, and the boards still did not move at all. I cursed the carpenter who had built this tomb. There has to be a way out. I kicked, stomped, slammed, I raged and screamed and fought, but nothing happened. I stopped, wiped the sweat from my face and closed my eyes. Think, 
The bin stood a little taller than Ruth and was as long in both directions as it was tall. I reached up to touch the boards above my head. They were rough hewn, put together with cold nails. My fingertips traced the length of each board, feeling along the splinters and the knots in the wood. The top was as solid as brick wall, each nail fastened tight. I fought back the panic that rose in my throat and tested the strength of each board that ran, ran from the top down to the sides. All strong, all sound. Think, remember. When Ruth and I slept down here, the far corner of the cellar went muddy with the heavy rain. Maybe the damp had eaten at the boards. I moved over to that corner of the bin and scooped the potatoes out of the way, heaping them behind me. I sat back and put my feet on each board, turning and pushed. The third board I tried gave away a little, and so did the next two. I moved the potato heap so I could best lean against it and push with my legs. I kicked, and there was a quiet crack. I kicked again and leaned forward to feel the boards. The one thing, one had a piece chipped off where the wood was rotted, though the other had a long split in it. I leaned back and I took a deep breath, and then I kicked and I kicked with all my strength until the wood broke and flew into the dark. I took to the stairs two at a time and paused before I entered the kitchen. The house was still silent. I hurried down the hall past the grandfather clock and up the stairs to the drawing room. I needed a map and had mine to steal the past too, if I could. I threw some firewood, some wood on the fire, lit a candle from the flames and carried it to the long dining table covered with maps and countless papers. I lit the, lit the rest of the candles on the table and it prepared for the feast. Then I searched through the papers, throwing those that were useless to me on the floor. Finally, I found a small map that showed the colonies from Massachusetts down to Georgia. The distance from Rhode Island to New York was the same as the tip of my little finger to the first knuckle under it. From New York to Charleston stretched all the way down my finger to the palm. The crackling firewood startled me. I glanced up. There was movement over the hearth, and for an instant, my heart caught in my throat. A ghost? The firelight brightened. No, not a ghost. I caught sight of myself in the large mirror that hung above the mantel. I could scarce recognize myself. My, hand fum my hands fumbled for a candle, and I moved to the mirror, guarding the flame and lit the oil lamps that were set onto the wall. The mirror caught the light and reflected it back at me. I leaned in. In truth, it seemed I was looking at a stranger who lived beyond the glass. My face was thinner than I'd remembered and longer from brown, brow to chin. My nose and mouth recollected Mama's, but the set of the eyes, those came from Papa. As I stared, their two faces came forth and drifted back until I could only see me. I turned my head to the side a bit and studied the brand on my face, and for the first time studied it hard, the capital I that proclaimed my insolent manners and crimes. I leaned closer to the mirror. The letter was a pink ribbon embroidered to my skin. I touched it smooth and warm, flesh made to silk. The scars on Papa's cheek had been, their lines, had been three lines across his cheek, carved with a sharp knife blade. He was proud of his marks. In the country of his ancestors, they made him into a man. I traced the eye with my fingertip. This is my country mark. I didn't ask for it, but I would carry it as Papa carried it. It made me his daughter. It made me strong. I took a step back, seeing near my whole self in the mirror. I pushed back my shoulders and raised my chin and back straight as an arrow. This mark stands for Isabel. The clock struck 11 and made me jump. I had so much to do and so little time. The fastest way off the island was a boat, such as the thought made me tremble. I searched through the sea of papers on the table until I found a chart of tides. I ran my fingers down the columns. Huzzah! The tide would not turn against me for a few hours. I lacked only a pass. Colonel Hawkins had been in the habit of keeping them locked in his chest drawer in the library, but he had become sloppy and overworked since the rebel victories. I opened the drawer of the secretary table and looked through the large boxes of official papers. There! I grabbed the paper and dashed to a small side table for a quill and a bottle of ink. I crowded the candles in close together and gave me enough light, took a deep breath to steady my hand. I dipped the quill. I took a second breath and bent over to fill in the empty bits of the pass. New York, blank, 1777. I wrote in 18th January in the blank space. It had been some time since I wrote out the letters. The J wobbled and the R appeared to be an N. I set down the quill. I wiped my, hand, my damp hands on my skirt and I picked it up again. 
This is to certify to whomever is, it may concern that the bearer, beha, the bearer, Heroff, blank, that was where I had to write my name. I scratched out Isabel and stopped. I was not a Lockton, nor a Finch. Isabel Rhode Island? That would not do. Isabel Cuff, after Papa, or Isabel Dina, after Mama. I closed my eyes and thought of home, the smell of fresh-cut hay and the taste of raspberries, robins chasing bugs in the bean patch, setting worms to work on the base of the corn plants, showing Ruth what was, what was weeds and what was flowers. I opened my eyes, dipped the quill, and wrote out my true name, Isabel Gardner. Being a free Negro had the commandment's permission to pass from this garrison to whatever place she may think proper. It was signed with lots of fancy titles that belonged to the colonel and the commandant and the king himself. I wished that there would have been space for Her Majesty Queen Charlotte of Great Britain to sign it too. She and me shared a birthday now, for I was reborn as Isabel Gardner, and that paper proved it. Wow, so this is an exciting chapter because Isabel, it seems like she's finally going to get what she wanted. It's going to be rough for her. We're going to have to see what next chapter brings. But she's going to try to seek that freedom that she's longed for so long and then to find Ruth. Let's hope she does. Chapter 44, Saturday, January 18th, 1777. I folded the map and passed, blew out the candles and crept down the stairs. I took the scissors out of the sewing basket in the kitchen and snipped at the threads of the hem of my cloak. I opened the map flat, inserted it between the lining and the woolen layer, then quick re-sewed the hem. Next, I dressed myself in all of my clothing, two shifts and two skirts, my cloak, shawl, and the blanket from my pallet. I took a basket from a high shelf and loaded it with bread, hard cheese, and a piece of dried beef. I cut from the slab that hung in the pantry. As I put the beef back, I studied the loose board in the back of the pantry. I pried it up and removed the lead piece from the king's statue and my cloth, my cloth packet of seeds. After some consideration, I took out common sense too and stuck all of it in the pocket I wore under my skirt, alongside the false pass. I walked down the hall, I reached for the handle of the front door and I stopped. Lady Seymour lay in the silent parlor. I doubted anyone had thought to put wood on the fire for her. That was my chore. Nope, not anymore. I was quit of this place. I reached again for the handle. But she was alone, old, and maybe freezing. Oh, it'd only take me an instant. I stepped into the parlor and Lady Seymour lay in her bed, her eyes closed and covers barely moving. Her fire was near burned down to the ash. I quick added logs and blew on the coals until small flames jumped and a bit into the wood. She wouldn't die of cold this night, not on my account. I was halfway to the door when I saw her silk reticule hung from the back of a chair. There were coins in that bag, coins that would help a girl set on walking to South Carolina. But that was stealing from somebody who had showed me kindness. But she stood by when Ruth was taken, and she returned me to Madame. But taking her money was still stealing. T'was wrong, but I swallowed hard, opened the bag, and removed the coins from the purse from the bottom. When I hung it back on the chair, Lady Seymour's eyes were open and following me. The question on her face was plain. I'm sorry, I said. She's made up her mind to sell me. She nodded once. I built up the fire. Would you like some water? She nodded again. I poured a cup of water from the pitcher and held it to her dry lips. She swallowed a little, but the rest spilled down her face. I set down the cup and I wiped away the water. I have to go. Please forgive me. Lady Seymour cut her eyes at her small husband's portrait on the bedside table, then to the coin purse that weighed down my hand. She gave a sharp nod of the head. One side of her mouth turned into a smile. I'll put the money back, I said. Forgive me. She shook her head from side to side, her mouth moving with tapped words, trapped words. I can keep it? Another nod and another pointed stare at her husband. Because I rescued his picture? She nodded again and a tear slipped down her cheek. Well then, ma'am, I'm happy to take it. As I set the coin purse in my pocket, she opened her mouth and a small sound escaped. Did you say something, Lady Seymour? I leaned in close, to it, though it scared me, for the smell of death hung over the bed like a fog. Her lips moved again, forming her last words to me. A whisper, almost too faint to hear. Run. I opened the front door of the locked-in mansion and looked up the street and down, not a soul in sight. I picked up the basket, tightened the blanket across my shoulders, and stepped over the threshold. I closed the door behind me, walked down the front steps, and turned west. My plan was simple and foolhardy. Steal a rowboat, cross the river to Jersey, and walk to Charleston. I was counting on the commotion of the Queen's Ball to distract folks. If I could get to the boat in time, the tide would help me pull away from New York. At the first corner, my feet stopped. 
This was where I turned north most mornings to head up to Bridewell. I urged my feet west towards the wharf, but they didn't listen. I remember my memory called up the feel of being locked in the stocks, of my face being burnt, of him watching me across the courtyard, him watching out for me. Twas Curzon who made sure I survived. Twas he who had been my steadfast friend since the day they brought me here. I couldn't. It would be hard enough to sneak past two armies, not get stolen again by someone who could tear up my pass, and I didn't even have a pass for him. How to explain that? No, I couldn't. I looked west, towards the river, then north, then again. No, no, couldn't. I shouldn't. But I had to. I had to get a debt to pay. Uh, good evening, sir, I said, holding up my basket to the huge soldier, Fisher, who opened the door to Bridewell Guardhouse. Fisher grunted and yawned. What's your business here? It's going on midnight. I prayed that the Lord and Mama would forgive the river of lies that had to flow out of my mouth. Colonel Hawking sent me, sir, to clean the cells, as you suggested. The guard stepped inside and I followed him. He sat heavily in a chair and drank from a mug on the table. Terrible late to be cleaning cells. The colonel got wind of a prison inspection arriving. Nobody told me, he growled. I swallowed hard. Should I flee and give up on this seamless, senseless plot? He spat into the fire. But they don't tell me nothing. What's in the basket? Food to keep me alive for a week, I thought. Uh, help yourself, I said. He pawed through it and took out the soft roll and, scuffed, and stuffed half of it in his mouth. Maybe I should ask the colonel. I thought a quick thought. Yes, sir, of course. He's at the Queen's Ball. Fisher winced. Ooh, best not to disturb that. All right, but don't be asking me for help. Cleaning the cells ain't my job. I took the key. Yes, sir. Wheelbarrow's in the hall, he said. Once you've filled it, roll it back here and I'll let you, you out so you can throw the muck and the filth in the pit. Mind your breathing. I turned. Pardon? Prisoner's been dropping dead like flies. Fever. The men in the search cell were mostly sleeping or dying or dead. None of them had the strength to do more than stare at me in the weak lantern light. I gagged and gagged again as I carried out overflowing chamber pots and forced myself to take a blanket from a corpse. Hurry, I screamed inside me. Hurry or it will be too late. Fisher looked upon and chuckled as I passed out passed back through the guardhouse with the barrow. I pitched the filth into the pit behind the prison and I prayed it was not going, not atop any corpses. Before I went back inside, I cleaned off my hands in a snowbank. My teeth rattled with the cold. No fun, is it? The guard asked as I passed through again. He pulled at the blanket around his shoulder. Hurry up now, I need my sleep. Yes, sir. I wiped my hands on my skirt. Almost done. I did not open the door to the second cell, nor the third. I set the lantern in the wheelbarrow, pushed it down to the hall to the fourth door on the right, and held my breath as I unlocked it. The stench was overpowering. Men unwashed for months, and puke and muck and rot was eating living flesh. Two dozen pairs of eyes watched me, burning in skull-like faces. No one spoke. I stepped inside, and I held the lantern higher. The faces were new to me, men and boys who had been moved here after Curzon's original companions died. "'Where's Mr. Dibbings?' I asked in a small voice. Died this morning, croaked a man. Everyone's dying. What about the slave boy? He pointed to a corner. Curzon lay insensible, his face burning with fever, his eyes rolled in his head. I called his name and pinched him, but he did not look my way or speak a word. He'll soon be dead. Leave him and run. A weight settled on my shoulders, I, like a cloak of iron. I bent closer to his ears. Shh, I whispered. A blast of cannon fire sounded from the battery, more royal celebrations. A few men looked to the window. He's dead, I stood up. Can someone help me get his body? No one moved. Then I shall do it myself. I grabbed Curzon under his armpits and dragged him across the floor and out the door. It took no effort at all to load him into the wheelbarrow. He weighed hardly more than a large sack of potatoes or a full butter churn. I dashed back into the cell, snatched his hat out of the shaking hands of a man who was putting it on his own head, grabbed the lantern and closed and locked the cell door. I could not ponder the fate of the rest of the men. Some things were just not meant to be born. Before I pushed him down the hall and into the guardhouse, I covered Curzon with the filthy blanket I'd stolen from the first cell. You're dead, I hissed to him. No noise. In the guardhouse, Fisher was sitting on his bed, leaning against the wall. He roused as I, sh as I shut the cell door. Got a nasty load here. Might take a bit to hurt, bury it. He nodded, Hal, already half asleep. As I pushed the wheelbarrow into the night, my legs shook so hard I thought sure they'd be set the earth to trembling and bring the whole building crashing down to the ground. That's the end of that chapter. So here we go. Isabel. Isabel wants freedom. She's got her freedom. She's got her past. She's ready to go. 
But this is the good person that Isabel is, that heart that she has, that we've seen throughout this whole story, this whole journey that she's had. She goes back for Curzon because she feels that she owes him. He's her friend, and she does it. She goes in, and she does it. But now, what's going to happen in the last chapters? Chapter 45, the last chapter. Saturday, January 18th to Sunday, January 19th, 1777. The prison was ten blocks from the wharf. I covered the first eight blocks as fast as a girl pushing a near-dead lump of boy could. Then I stopped. A sentry fire was lit at the corner, burning between us and the last two blocks of the wharf. Six British guards stood warming their hands, their muskets leaning against the small pyre of fire, pile of firewood. A dog lay at their feet, head resting on its front paws. One of the men stretched his arms over his head and gave a mighty yawn, and his companions laughed at him. The dog lifted his head once and looked in our direction, but a soldier reached down to scratch his ears and, be, and he relaxed. If I tried to push the wheelbarrow over the cobblestones, we'd be arrested in an instant. If I were half an hour earlier, we could have tracked backwards and gone down another street, but the tide wouldn't wait. I backed up as slow as I could, cringing with every creak of the, of the wheels. Once we were all set out, all out of sight of the men, I pulled the blanket off Curzon. Get up, I whispered as I helped him from the wheelbarrow. We need to get past these soldiers, and after that, it's only two blocks to the river. Boat? he asked, leaning against a wall. Of course, follow me and stay close. He took one step forward and collapsed against me, the two of us crumbling to the ground. No, I scolded as I, I stood up and pulled him to his feet. You have to try harder. Sorry, country, he muttered. He was not strong enough to walk on his own, and I was not strong enough to carry him on my back, not after pushing him so far. I pulled his arm across my shoulder and had him lean on me heavily. Step quiet, I whispered as we drew close to the corner again. Twenty paces of open street separated us from the shadows on the other side. One of the soldiers walked to the woodpile, picked up a split log, carried it to the fire, and tossed it on the flames. For the moment, all the men had their backs turned to us. Ready? I said in Curzon's ear. He nodded. I drew a deep breath and we started to walk, soft as we could. Twenty paces stretched twenty miles, every faint crunch of our shoes sounding like gunshots. Five steps. I count silently. Six. Seven. Curzon had little strength in his legs. He faltered and almost fell again. I wrapped my own arm, or my other arm, around him and clutched his shirt. Eight, nine, ten. The dog lifted his head. He stared right at me and barked. One of the soldiers startled, shouted, "Look at that!" and pointed to the sky. The heavens exploded into the red glare of rockets and white fountains of light. Curzon and I stood as if planted, amazed at the sight of the fireworks being shot off in honor of Queen Charlotte. The dog barked furiously in our direction, but the soldiers were all staring at the illuminations above. The noise rolled up booms that sounded like thunder and cannons. The men all smiled and laughed at the spectacle. I dragged Curzon across the street down the last two blocks to the wharf. It was dark, no watch posted, as I'd hoped. Thank you, Mama, I muttered as we crawled into the rowboat. What'd you say? Curzon groaned. I untied us from the wharf. Never mind. But he was already insensible again. I picked up the oars. I rode that river. I rode that river like it was a horse delivering me from the devil. My hands blistered. The blisters popped. They reformed and popped again. I rode with my hands slick with blood. My back, my shoulders, my arms, they pulled with the strength of a thousand armloads of firewood split and carried, of water buckets toted for miles, of the burdens of every New York day and New York night boiled into two miles of water that I was going to cross. Set after set, the Queen's fireworks exploded over the roofs of the city, over Cavanston, over the mansions that held the King's subjects in all their ball gowns and fancy dress uniforms. Her fireworks blasted off and everybody gazed into the sky as I rode and rode and rode past their homes, aside their warehouses, underneath their cannons, and out into the open harbor betwixt New York Island and Jersey. My wits wandered some, but the time my hands started bleeding, Tongues of fog oozed across the water and curled around the bits of ice that floated past. I saw in the fog the forms of people. They never came close enough that I could see their faces. Once I reached out, feeling a warm presence, but I near tipped the boat over and had to, dra to grab through the oar before it slid away. My hands plunged into the icy water as I rowed and rowed, but it didn't hurt after that because my hands had froze. 
I rode and the tide pulled and the ghosts who could in indeed travel over water tugged my boat with all their strength. My eyes closed and the moon drew me west, away from the island of my melancholy. When my eyes opened, I knew I had died and passed on to glory. Heaven was crystal lit with white angel fire, colored peach at the edges. Heaven smelled of wood smoke. I blinked. The Bible did not mention that heaven smelled of wood smoke. I blinked again. When I opened my eyes, they watered because of the bright morning light. The rowboat had come ashore in a tangle of bushes that overhung a small bank at the side of the river. The branches overhead were all coated in ice. I was coated in ice, too, that fractured and crackled as I moved. I looked to the water, then to the rising sun, then to the water again. I looked around me. No houses, no ships, no wharfs. The river was narrow and flowing out to sea, south. The sun rose beyond the water, and at the other side of the river, I was on the west bank. I was in Jersey. I had set myself free. I wiped at the water that flowed down my cheeks and kicked at the stinking bundle at the bottom of the boat. You alive? I asked. The bundle groaned and pushed aside the shredded blankets. Curzon lifted his head enough to look at me sitting. There was a fool grin on his face. Where are we? He asked in a thin voice. I think we just crossed the River Jordan. I stood up, steadied myself as the boat rocked a bit, and offered him my hand. Can you walk? That's the end. So we don't know what happens from there. I know some of my students were quite disappointed with that ending because we, we really don't know what happens next. But there are two other books, so you could try and read those. Um, yeah, so Isabel saved herself and Curzon, and then she's off to her next adventure. Thank you for listening. Thank you for following me on Isabel's journey.